Hello everyone and welcome back to TNO which we're playing as the United States of America. So, at the end of episode 10 I said we would continue playing as Glenn for the United States and we are. But at the same time, we I decided, you know what, screw it. I might not have a lot of time and I don't need sleep because I want to continue this RFK run right now. So this is obviously number 11B while my Glenn campaign is just called number 11. So, here we are just because we were doing we were so great as RFK. I don't want to give this up because I've actually had a lot of fun with this and we're very socially democratic here. So let us continue focusing on the debts, improving the system for as many Americans as we possibly can. And we have Airshot. If you think FBI agents, after their years of intensive training, would be able to tell the difference between Ramsey Clark, Attorney General of the United States of America, and Rams Ramsey Clark, insurance salesman, you'd be wrong. They grabbed the poor dude off the street and beat him black and blue before they realized that they had the wrong guy. For Christ's sakes, he's 10 years younger than Clark, and they don't even look alike. Now he's lying in a hospital bed and threatening to sue. He saw their faces, so we'll have to give him a big payout to shut him up and keep his out of their papers. Well, we probably shouldn't try that again, but we've got to silence Clark as soon as possible. We could go back to the letter-writing idea, or perhaps we could send Hoover's boys to tap his phones and see if we can record him saying something scandalous. Uh, now this is only came up because at the time we did Con Contel Pro, which hurt our popularity to a degree. But uh, I silenced the cabinet, and this is just one of the decisions we took. So it, it doesn't mean anything, I think, in, in, at all, really. So uh, give me that traitor's person. Yes, I'll hold at the mercy of the telephone event next. So let's see. We have 49 center NPP members. We've got 20 far right members. There's no Yakiites. There's no left. NPP, so we're doing pretty darn well for ourselves. It is, of course, November 1968, and let's grab some rifles. So it's very weird for me having two campaigns at once in the, in the same mob, but we have 31 Republican Democrats, so the center NPP is doing great, and they're working well together, which is awesome. Now, maybe I should not have cut down like support for the NPP over time, trying to get Glenn elected for this campaign, but you know, I don't really care. It doesn't matter to me. We're going to get as much political power as possible. We're going to continue spending more money. Continue, continue, continue. And I'll oh, keep building more things up. At the mercy of the telephone, Ramsey Clark's phone calls are just among the most boring things known to man. The junior agent tasked with monitoring Clark's call rude his misfortune. They're worse than every lectured Quantico. Every dinner at his mother-in-law's house. So far today, Clark has made three calls, all on the most mundane subjects imaginable. Unless the agent thinks, half asleep in the middle of the afternoon, that he's speaking in some kind of code. Doesn't seem likely, though. Another week of this, and he jump in into the Potomac. Why does Hoover want this guy's phones taped? Going by his calls, he's... Squeaky clean, nothing to see here. We know nothing, it's time to plant some evidence. Oh boy. Oh boy, 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 boy. What does we got? Redraw the school district? So, we're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna do observed court practices, a racist prison system, the underlying problem. So the NPP is really not, the far right version of the NPP are not really gonna like us. But at the same time, we gotta do with charity for all. And of course, we did we did get Hawaii and stuff. We need to do all this stuff as well, but we'll we'll get there eventually. With charity for all, America is by far the wealthiest, most prosperous, and free nation on the planet. While Germany continues to flounder, just desperately trying to preserve its empire of evil, and Japan perpetually stamps the boot down un upon its oppressed peoples, we continue to stand tall as a beacon of liberty and prosperity. And yet, there are still pockets of people within our nation without the means to live. They struggle to put food on the table. They struggle to find legal counsel when they have been wronged. They live in the most squalid and dire conditions imaginable. And allowing this to happen to our own people, how can we call ourselves any better than the fascists? Robert Kennedy intends to rectify the situation with immediate effect, with a range of measures aimed at granting aid and welfare to most vulnerable. Now, I don't know, because earlier, between 64 and 68, there's a high, ch there's a pretty good chance that RFK gets assassinated. But after the election? Maybe? I have no idea. But a new approach. Integrating America's schools is proving even, even more difficult than we anticipated, as many state governments, mostly in the South, do their utmost to block and misdirect our efforts. It also doesn't help that the majority of black people live in homogeneous ghettos far too from from uh, white school districts to be practical, leading to our primary method of integrating school districts being busing black students into the new recently desegregated schools. Obstructionist state governments are well aware of this and are going to almost ridiculous lengths to prevent us from being able to bus black students, desperately trying to find excuses for why the school buses aren't available to us. We've tried the carrot, now it's time for the stick. Despite their pretensions at self-determination, states are still heavily dependent on federal funding to stay afloat, particularly poor southern states. It's about time they learn that deliberately standing in the way of integration will not come without consequences. Let's see if they fall in line and comply with school integration after we threaten to shut down the federal funding. Hit them in the pocketbook. Cool. Just in case, I will eventually keep doing uh, uh, E-Southern Fears. 
occasionally so we we'll be seen less as less as a liberal person even though we're pu we're push pushing for more progressive stuff here states rights or human rights Barry Goldwater, that slimy Democratic senator from Arizona, has become an increasingly painful thorn in her side. Seemingly opposed to every single one of our policies and ideals, Goldwater has become a strong critic of our administration and spends most of his time outside of Congress ranting and raving on television screens and radio stations across America. He's become notably more vocal lately after we announced our bill to withhold federal funding from states that refuses to comply with school integration. Like most racists, he's been protesting integration using thinly veiled arguments for the rights of the states to be, we must suppose, as racist as they choose. The Democrats love this stuff, and the rightists that are supposed party brothers have left their herd, their approval be heard. The general consensus at the moment seems to be that Goldwater is just angling for a presidential run in 68. But regardless of his motives, he's proven to be one of our major opponents in Washington, and we need to find some way to effectively deal with him before his dominance of the political discourse comes to bite us in the butt in the polling booth. Integration busing is very unpopular at the moment among all but our strongest supporters, and if we continue to aggressively push, busing it might just hurt us and give Goldwater and his ilk more ammunition. We could steam ahead with our plans no matter the cost, or we could pull back and preserve our political capital. After all, surely a fire saved, starved of, a fire start of oxygen will gut her out. Uh, no one stands in the way of the quality. Uh, we already won the election, so... <clears throat> I'm not really sure what they're trying to get at, seeing as with in sixty between sixty four and sixty eight we focus on civil rights, and we don't focus on this too much, but at the same time we focus on getting Hawaii back. So we'll see what happens. I mean, my goal is to still cut down the debt to nothing, which would be great, but we're probably going to be spending more and more money, especially as we get more and more healthcare, which is probably going to increase our debt by a little bit and our deficit. But whatever. A thoroughly stirred pot. That rat Goldwater saw his opportunity and went for the throat. He called our bluff on integration and busing in a televised interview, and he won't stop giving quotes about the supposed evils of the federal government to any journalist with a notepad and a fountain of pen. The president was forced to respond in kind, but his remarks seemed to have been to be inflating the anger of the state's rights types as well as the usual racist. To put it simply, the situation is going back quicker, or going bad quicker than we're able to react with. Goldwater seems to be two steps ahead and is able to turn every move we make to his advantage. To make matters worse, Goldwater's had quite a bit of success in mobilizing the small government grassroots by pushing the angle that integration busing is an example of federal tyranny triumphing over the rights of the states. Goldwater has very quickly become the big biggest danger to our administration. We can only hope his run of good luck runs out before he becomes too big to stop. He's playing us like a god dang fiddle. Uh, yeah, actually, in real life, I'm pretty sure Goldwater in Arizona desegregated the schools. So, I he this is pretty close to what he actually believes. Because he, he opposed, I'm pretty sure, in our timeline, like, the federal mandate. But in his own state, he, he voted to desegregate Arizona. Which I don't, there's, I don't know about that much about Arizona. I don't think I've ever been there. I don't think there's a ton of African Americans in Arizona, especially in 68, but I could be wrong. What a tangled web we hate weave. There's no such thing as a man without secrets. Everyone does something that others would consider shameful, and once the cat's out of the bag, there's a little chance of getting it back in. A little scandal can destroy careers and ruin lives, which, of course, is what, just what we need. If we can't silence him privately, then the time has come to put Clark in the court of public opinion. Only the method remains. Should we make up the biggest, juiciest, nastiest lie we possibly can, or should we send some agents to investigate his private life and see if there's something real we can dig up? Clark maybe seem like the world's most boring stuff shirt, but those types are often the ones who have the most skeletons in the closet. Let's razzle-dazzle them. Get out of the camera's boards. Let's catch them in the act. Uh, can, I guess we can do that one. doesn't really matter. Working well. Now we want the MPP to win as much as possible. Uh, the power of compromise. Thankfully, we brought the pot down from a boil to a simmer by scaling back our integration busing policy, preserving our political capital, and robbing Goldwater of the public outrage he wanted to sow. Ultimately, we scaled back busing to affect only consenting states, nullifying the state's rights angle that was a ten pole of Goldwater's argument. Nevertheless, it's hard to see this as a victory. We avoided a fight by modifying our policies to fit the pre preferences of a bunch of crypto racists who'd rip up the civil rights act if they thought they could get away with it. At least Goldwater's been forced to begrudgingly consent to busing, though, and the Demo Democrats have ceased their endless belly aching. Something doesn't seem quite right, though. Goldwater's been uncharacteristically quiet of late, and seems to have dipped out of the public spotlight he loves so much, worryingly. It seems rather like the calm before the storm. What is he up to? We get more social democracy, academic base goes up rapidly, as well as research facilities. That's cool. I kind of do want to prove party unity, though. But, oh, the second minute election results are in. If you want to read this, go right ahead. We'll see what happens. And the polls are, up uh, polls are updated. Cool. Uh, let's see. Eat Southern Fears. We get a little more unified. You know what? Let's go ahead and do that once. Yeah, I want to do more stuff here, too. I want to get better academic base, obviously, but... National Party well, looks better than Southern States and goes a little bit more progressive. Oh, Campaign with Wallace. East Southern Fears goes a little more unified, less liberal. Campaign with Wallace, less liberal, more unified, and looks better in Southern States, so... Obviously, we don't do this one or this one for now, but... East Southern Fears. What's the difference? Campaign with Wallace? Uh, we don't really care about that far right for now, so... 
East Southern Fears, just to, just to keep it on the simmer, because I, I really don't know if it's going to affect us. Prison election season over. If you want to read this, go right ahead. The inauguration begins on January 20th. Hail to the Chief, whoever it may be. Cool. I mean, like my Glenn campaign at the same time. 49 senators for the center and PP. Beautiful. An affluent society. Look at that. Oh my goodness. The center. Oh, right, we got a Republican there. Alan Cranston, huh? I like looking through this to see if we have. Oh, George McGovern. People here that we might know from real life or uh, that are a little bit more famous than other people. Um, not too much. New York, the New England area. Not that too many people that I know about. Let's see. Cool. All right, an affluent, affluent society. First thing you notice about hu Hubert Humphrey is his nasally or nasal high-pitched voice. It made Kennedy's forehead throb on the best of days, but after an hour of Humphrey screaming at him over the phone, he was in the throes of a hideous cluster headache. As Humphrey screeched about dirty tricks and due process, Kennedy rubbed his aching forehead. I felt like he had a dis diadem around his head, with it, which kept tightening with every furious remonstrance. Apparently, one of Hoover's latest incompetents had gone to Humphrey instead of Kennedy to consult him about the plan to slander Clark with an outrageous scandal on Humphrey. Irritatingly ethical dude that he is, immediately disavowed the plan and called the White House to yell about it. The president seems to have been able to convince Humphrey that it was Hoover's idea and he hadn't heard about it yet, but he knows he's on seriously thin ice. One more screw up and we're in serious strife. Finally able to end the one-sided tirade, Kennedy hung up. Leaning back in his chair, he wondered how long it would be until Humphrey connected the dots between this and his use of the FBI to silence reactionaries in the party. Kennedy yelled for his secretary to bring him an aspirin and doubt Hoover's number, intend to fix this crisis, and shut up Clark before this gets worse than it already is. Kennedy listened to the dial tone. Hoover loved to keep him waiting. While he waited, he thought about what Hoover would suggest. Would he send his agents to tap Clark's phones or look into his private life? Leave no stone unturned. I don't know. We can still silence people, but it is what it is. Yeah, I'm not too worried about paying off the debt, because we're going to get it eventually, so... Uh, like with the Glenn campaign, I'm sorry that this this is somewhat just similar. We're getting more APC armor, getting more stuff like that, just because that's what comprises most of our army. <laughs> most of our army is just literally just tank divisions and APCs. So, with charity for all, military austerity. Now let's go ahead and come down here. Observe court practices. I think I've, I might have read this before, I'm not really sure at this point, but laws may come from Congress, but it is a humble court which interprets their letter and spirit. Owing to this, the men and women who extensively study America's labyrinthian set of laws can effectively decide how laws will look like to the American people, should Congress and court come at odds with one another. A situation will undoubtedly arise when any of the laws of the former conceived will diverge significantly in wording by the time that nation's law enforcement receive their memorandums. There exists no better instance of this phenomenon than the extent legal system of our southern states. Manned by Dixiecrats and sympathizers, courts of law from North Carolina to Texas have long had a free hand in impeding the implementation of civil rights laws within their jurisdictions. Sitting through the archives of verdicts and rulings is unfortunately a burden we cannot do without. At least from there, kickstarting the dismantlement of Jim Crow is, is as simple as replacing the powdered wigs, apparently keeping it aloft. I, I apologize if we've already read that before. I, at this point, I've played through this campaign like 10 times, so mentally I have no idea to a degree where we're at, so how the other half lives. For the most part, the first day at the new school is a terrifying ordeal, but as Leroy Thomas walks through the swinging double doors of Rutherford, Hayes, Rutherford Hayes Middle School, he mostly felt excited, tempered slightly by an undercut of trepidation. As the school's first black student, he knew he represented his whole community to his fellow students and resolved to make a good and first impression and to make the most of this new opportunity he's been given. At 8.30, science. Leroy could hardly believe his eyes as he was shown the vast collection of equipment his new school had for experiments. His teacher taught the class the basic principles of chemistry by showing them how to make elephant toothpaste. Leroy ooed and awed along his new classmates as a black goop shot out of the tube. 12.30 English. Literature. Every student was handed a copy of Huckleberry Finn. Ooh, I like that book. Which Leroy was surprised to learn was his to keep. At his old school, they never had enough of books for everyone. The school turned, took turns to read it aloud, and he felt everyone's eyes on him when the boys next to him suddenly stopped as he came to the word, uh, N. <laughs> oh, man. For a moment, the boys seemed to be at a loss for words, and he skipped over it, and tension abated. It felt Leroy made him feel awkward. Oh, boy. Me too. 4.30 home time. Leroy said goodbye to the trio of boys he'd befriended at recess and made his way outside, trying to ignore the eyes of some of the other students and their parents, boring through him like a drill. He knew from the beginning that being the, first, the school's first black kid wasn't going to be easy, but he was sure he'd be able to win over them in time. As he walked home, he resolved to push himself harder at school than ever before. He would prove to all of them that he deserved to be there just as much as they did, and felt determined to make most of the opportunity he'd be given to make a better life for himself. The first of many... Who, in, who? Which school does that kid go to? Rutherford B. Hayes Middle School or something like that? Like, you get to keep your books? Dude, like, what? And the NPP is right now ready for anything, which is great. But, how many schools have you guys been to where you could keep your books? I mean, let's see. 
Middle school? I don't think so. High school? Definitely not. Yeah, definitely not in high school. You had to pay for your book rentals in, in my state. So, uh, this is weird. Oh, boy. Goldwater's at it again. Positioning himself as a man of the people, he's been touring American towns trying to stoke white uh, middle-class fury against our integration policies, angling to make it seem like we're a bunch of tyrants wanting to crush the power of the states and corrupt the pure, wholesome, insipid traditional American way of life. Town churches, and community halls that across the nation are the sites of furious speeches denouncing our administration and commentators on radio waves and TV screens everywhere rip apart the president's character and his every policy. It seems like we've got not a single friend in the moment. White suburbanites are angry we're trying to integrate in their towns and communities. White or urban southerners won't stop hollering about states' rights, and even African Americans aren't in our corner at the moment, seeing as not as being dedicated enough to integration. It's an old political adage that you can't make everyone happy, but we don't seem to be able to make anyone happy at all at the moment. All we can do is stay strong and hope it blows over soon. This is all Goldwater's fault. Good thing the elections are over, my friends. Ha <laughs> ha! This is very weird that it's happening now, you know, after the election, but hey, you know, timing is, uh. It's an art form, you know, making sure you time things correctly. But that poverty rate, I am going to crush it. And by crush it, I mean expand everything as much as we can. Oh, we have a, just, I don't care, just keep boosting it for now. We gotta get more political power. More, 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 more. 0.91 a day, not bad. Medium taxation, observe court practices. And we, I'm just gonna go through this as fast as possible. National Committee, ooh, more deeply political power, National Ethics Committee, as part of the country's finely, finely tuned system of checks and balances, America's venerable constitution has granted the president the power to create new agencies and commissions without consulting Congress on the matter. Often these organizations benefiting the ad hoc nature of their creation tackled single issues with the resources they are apportioned. President Kennedy has seen it to fit form one commission by executive order. The National Ethics Commission's mission bears a simplicity that masks its significance to ensure that the government enforces the law to both its letter and spirit. In, just a war in a just world, the president can trust his subordinates across the country to uphold their oaths. For an especially unjust royalty remarks, the NEC is a necessity in order to protect the march of progress. Cool. I'm getting worried a little bit. And the results are in. Uh, so I, I feel like we, we gotta get be seen as less as a liberal candidate, but the results are in. And they're pretty much what we expected. Our Justice Committee's report has confirmed our suspicions that America's justice institutions are completely corrupt and in desperate need of reform to curb the little horrible practices they engage in. Our courts, it seems, have too little to no integrity. Judges and juries alike are horrifically prejudiced against African Americans who are both found guilty more often and receive harsher sentences than whites on trial for the same crimes. Blacks are frequently denied the judicial rights promised to all in the Constitution and are often hoodwinked or forced into confessing by racist cops intent to sending black men to prison for no other reason than for the color of their skin. The injustice perpetrated upon Americans by the very system meant to uphold it is utterly disgusting and is a total subversion of everything America stands for. We have to fix this and now. In America, Lady Justice is blind. It's anything but blind. It's time she was double-blinded. Again, wouldn't hurt to take away her sword either. To end up... To the end of a dream, when he last stood to take the oath of office, Robert F. Kennedy had stood before a nation that dared to hope that things could be better. Now as he gazed onto the assembled thousands who had come to see him, he knew that hope was no longer daring. It was natural, open, loud, and proud. In their faces, men and women, the white and the black, the Jew and the Gentile, he could see for the first time in America that wanted, it, that wanted the future to arrive. He beamed as he stepped up to the podium, letting the roaring, cheering crowd wash over him. Deep down, he dearly hoped that John was watching wherever he was. We stand here today in the name of liberty and justice. At the heart of Western democracy is a belief that all men are created equal, and so the extension of this belief and the enlargement of liberty for all must be to the, be the supreme goal of a Western society. Others have turned from this goal and marched on into the darkness and decay, yet where we have, or where they have faltered, we have presented forwards, and in four short years we have extended the branch of freedom and human rights to all, no matter their race, color, or stature in life. But as in all things, justice is never final. To walk the path to a better future is to walk a path without end. There will be no, those who will try to steer us from the path and those who insist that we have walked far enough. We must always recognize that the fact that the work to better fulfill the promise that our God-given country is founded upon shall never be finished. We must keep walking, keep improving, keep striving to create a true land of liberty that will shine bright in the world of darkness. President Kennedy smiled even brighter as the crowd applauded. He knew that he could not grow complacent. There were still those who would try to stop him from doing what he truly needed to get done. Yet knowing that the majority of America was with him, it made him all the more resolute in his ambitions. His dream, John's dream, the American dream, would be realized for the sake of those smiling faces before him. He would fight for all of them and fight against any who would stand in his way, and he would do all of it gladly, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Hmm, no, no JFK. Secures a second term, a wind of change sweeps America, and please don't assassinate me. I I really have no idea whether we can get assassinated or not, so I hope we can't. But I want to say that there's a, probably a good chance that we can still get bye bye we'll, we'll call it like that. I really hope we don't, though. Alright, so I don't think I need to see this anymore, this political landscape uh, part of the decision tab, because well, elections are over. And we're doing pretty well, and we don't need to unify the party because we are pretty god darn unified at this point, so. One thing I do 
I don't know, maybe not wish, but maybe hope to see someday in the future, <clears throat> is that research costs money. I wish it was, you know, part of the whole debt and expenditures system, just because <clears throat> I think it'd be a little more interesting, because research teams, they need money. I mean, maybe it's all from the private market and stuff, but even then, maybe we should be able to influence that a little bit. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I have no idea what the TNO dads are thinking, but I think that'd be really cool, just because I... I started off with Hoi 2, like, really back in the day. Hoi 2, uh, Darkest Hour, Hearts of Iron game, and you had to spend money to get research done. So, I've always kind of wished we had that system back, and even Hoi 3, that was there too. But, you know, instead of focusing on this, just in case we might get killed here, let's tour the nation. Capitol Hill, by necessity, we can't do that one yet. Throw the nation. Robert Kennedy is not content to be seen as yet another career politician sitting in an ivory tower. He needs the people to know that he truly cares for them and he wants to understand the issues that they really face. To this end, the president's plan to embark on a grand tour across the whole of the United States and where he will visit numerous com communities and people from all walks of life. He will use this opportunity to speak directly to the American people and get a view from the ground of the problems affecting their everyday life. This should hopefully foster a better relationship between the office of president and the people that the office dedicates itself to serving. Sounds like a good idea. And how much political power are we getting now? We have the Ethics Committee, so we almost get one political power a day. But unfortunately, I will be right back. Alright, my friends, sorry about that, but I had to go use the restroom because, well, I drink way too much water. Really do. But regardless, we have RFK as president once again, and I am still hoping that we don't get assassinated, but you never know. Ooh, I do want to fight for schools. Actually, how is our academic base doing? Our academic base is actually going up by 4.25 a month, month, which is pretty good. we got primary schooling. Ooh, in America, we only have primary schooling, secondary schooling, tertiary schooling, academic golden age. Hmm. Should I risk it? We get one political power a day. It's not like we need to spend it too, for too much else. The diplomatic arena. War and pacifism. We get more war support, of course, but... Eh. Sorry, I click on the stuff really quickly. But, you know, Russian militarization. This is still from Rally the Center. Consolidate it into our wing. Into more of our wing. I mean, we're already doing really... Great. Yeah, I mean, that's what stuff when we were debating with Japan and stuff. You know what I'm going to do? We're going to fight for our schools, maybe. Unless we get some all stuff around here. We are going to fight for the schools. We're going to lose a little bit of uh, from money from our reserves, but I don't really care. We get some more stability, too. We're going to do that. I'm going to eat Southern Fears. Just in case. Just in case. Both will be great to do. Really great. Less than 50 billion in, in GDP? Awesome. Now, I, I really want to know how far we can get with RFK. How far can we push the envelope before we might get killed? Uh, to the nation, the journey of a thousand miles, Robert Kennedy sat in the Oval Office, Humphrey Hubert, and James Rowley, Secret, Secret Service Director, broke across from him. So, everything all set? Yes, Mr. President, replied Rowley. All of your bags and necessary items are aboard Air Force One, and everything is secured for a smooth running of things while you're on the campaign. Excellent, said Robert Kennedy, standing up from a resolute desk. Now it's just the decision of where to start. Wait, said Humphrey. I thought we had agreed upon Boston for our first destination, to show up our support and a stronghold of ours. What's changed? Kennedy scratched his Well, you see, I'm not so sure that's the best course of action right now. I think we need to focus more on the party unity by traveling to more conservative strongholds. Our supporters in Boston aren't going anywhere. I was thinking Maine. Humphrey sighed. It's your call, Bobby, but everything's already set up for Boston. You're the boss, but I think that we could, that was still be the best choice. Kennedy looked out the window over the White House lawn. It was a terif terrifically beautiful day. One good for flying, I suppose. He had been set on Maine, but now he wasn't so sure. Where to fly to? Boston, Maine. I've been to Boston. Boston's really nice. It can be really nice. Maine. Hmm. Do we want to go to Boston for a first destination? Party unity? Eh, let's go to Boston. Eh, go to Boston. I don't know. Why not? And we'll tour the nation. We could con continue. We could continue to consult with King, but uh, and those who knew best. But eh, we get more social democracy, which could be good. We could go united and ready, but we'll see what happens. Plan suburbs. So American cities will grow regardless of its politics, but with a formal prohibition of redlining, we now have an opportunity to wipe out the wipe the slate clean to the extent with some of its new construction projects. The suburb of the future that shall be built today, President Kennedy boasted, will be well planned, well connected, and well integrated. Well within the reach of hospitals and police departments and supermarkets, with well within reach of the cities and its jobs, well within reach for the pockets of any American, white or black, or anyone else. In order to better bring this to fruition, MPP congressmen have brought forward the Fair Housing Act from the committee. Its articles codify the President's assurances into tax worthy of joining the ranks of Americans' legal code. Resistance is an inevitability, but not least from the South. Then again, the Titanic Battle for the Civil Rights Act has made attempts to pass bills that follow up pale in comparison. 
Welcome to Meet Your Neater, Slaughterhouse 5. So, one book that enjoyed overwhelming success during the anti war years was Kurt Vonnegut's classic Slaughterhouse 5. The book's protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, is captured by the Wehrmacht during the defense of Scotland and is held in a slaughterhouse in southeast London. Billy's a poorly trained soldier who's come to the dislike war, refusing to fight for his country during the Allied bombing of the city, though. His acquaintance and fellow soldier, Roland Weary, dies of an infection, and shortly before his demise, he blames his death on Billy. He then escapes the slaughterhouse, and the novel proceeds to his near death experience in a plane crash where he was abducted by aliens. These aliens, the Trell. Trelmafadorians taught Billy their outlook on life, death, and fate, causing Billy to become an orator. Critics condemned the disorderly structure of the book, but praised its clear anti-war message. Many readers appreciated the way Vonnegut included his own war experiences in the novel, quickly making the book a bestseller. The book itself was printed in multiple European languages, but it was banned throughout Europe shortly after its publication. Through the book's anti-war message, one can see Vonnegut's disdain for the Reich and the Japanese. Well, at least we can get some good out of it. Because right now, with RFK, if we get involved in wars, he finishes them. Heard of uh, Africa? Yeah, it's liberated. They've got freedom there, even in Bay Africa. You heard of Indonesia? Well, it's now called Free Indonesia because of what RFK did to them. Let's see. Uh, anywhere else? I don't think so. Look, the Boston speech. Boston was a wonderful city for the president to visit. He was greeted by large cheering crowds cramped up along the narrow colonial era street as his motorcade passed down Freedom Trail. I'd been there, actually. Finally standing before thousands in Boston Common. He could tell this place loved him. Waving flags and carrying signs, they cheered for him when he stopped up to the stage only quieting to hear him speak. Bostonians, how great it is to return to the city of my birth. You know, I remember growing up on the outskirts of the city in Brookline, uh, and all the terrible signs that they used to have. Uh, outside businesses, stores, everything. Do you remember what they said? People of Boston, no colors allowed or whites only. Traveling down the Freedom Trail today, though, I saw no such signs. Did you? I doubt it, because the city of Boston is free, welcoming, and undoubtedly progressive. I want to remind you that what is the progressives of America stand for? This is what we fight for, and more important than that, it is what we will achieve. Desegregation across America, that's what we want, and that's what we'll get. Fight the good fight, Boston, stay progressive. With that, the president stepped down off the podium to let the mayor of the city give his slower, more so sober speech. After a few hours of pleasantries and intermixed comments by Kennedy, Humphrey, and the mayor, it was time to head back. Stepping off the platform, the Vice President Humphrey turned to Kennedy. Not bad, Bobby, he said. Where to next? Detroit, Chicago. Ooh, Detroit. I've never been to Detroit. I've been really close, though. I've been to Chicago before. I've been up to... I don't think I've been up to... I've been... I don't think I've been to Milwaukee, either. I've been through Minneapolis, I think. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe not. Cedar Rapids. I don't think I've ever been to Iowa. I think I've completely avoided Iowa before, just because... I don't know. Seems like a cool place. Let's go to Chicago. It's a big, it's a huge city, just like Detroit. Mm, can't really do anything here. The Chicago speech. At a glance, Chicago looked like just about any large city in America, but no, President Kennedy it represented much more. The progressives held a stronghold of the urban population and had been to be assured that it remained that way. The motorcade had been taking a scenic route along the whole south side, from the airport through Chinatown, and then south through the front steps of the Museum of Science and Industry, where Kennedy now stood before thousands of people. People of Chicago, I think it's appropriate that I now stand in front of a Museum of Industry and Science while giving a speech in one of the most industrial cities of the great nation. Time and time again, this great city and its residents have proved themselves to be a beacon of enterprise welcoming hard-working Americans. Chicago, in short, is the embodiment of the American dream. Growing up in New England, from time to time you would hear about the term Yankee ingenuity get thrown around. It basically refers to the American indomitable spirit of hard work and get stuff done determination that has allowed us to become as great as prosperous as we currently are. Sh standing here in Chicago, all I can see is Yankee ingenuity. However, there is a poison to all this hard work. Some would see workers give nothing. Uh... If it meant that their own pockets might get a little deeper. Workers of all kinds deserve rights. They deserve the right to unionize. They deserve the right to demand better wages. The progressives have always fought for such things, and we will continue to fight until the plight of the blue-collar man is rectified. Kennedy stepped back from the podium and stood next to Hubert, Hubert Humphrey, the crowd going up in applause behind him. Well, that's Chicago taken care of, Humphrey said. Anything else before we hit the road again? I think I'll hit all the bases, replied Kennedy. I think we go to Denver. Yellowstone. Ooh, I don't know. Ooh, I, I've never... Actually, I've been to the Denver, Denver airport. I've never actually explored Denver. Utah. Uh, Dog City? Or New Canaan? Actually, where is where is Yellowstone in Utah? Wait, is it Utah? No, no. Yeah, Utah. No, that's Salt Lake City. I'm thinking there. Yellowstone. I've been to Yellowstone and West Yellowstone, too. I'd love to go there. Let's go to Denver. I think that'd be kind of cool. I've never been to Denver. I really not, never explored it, but we'll see what happens. Rocky Mountain High. Man, we, we go a day at a time to get to these places? That's really... That's a lot of energy, man. Denver, Colorado is one of the fastest growing cities in America. In the past 15 years, its population has increased by nearly a quarter. To the dismay of many less welcoming Americans, it has increased in a manner, manner disagreeable to them, with many of the new residents being of the Latino persuasion. The Chicano movement had a strong foothold here, and can provide a strong, strong foothold for the progressives in Colorado. On the steps of the state capitol, President Robert Kennedy stood before thousands of people held speech in hand. 
people of Denver and my fellow Americans. I come today not to give a speech of fancy terminology, but to state a fact. At the core of the American society, there is a disease, an, an inborn illness that we willingly accept as a social norm when it is clear that it weakens us terribly. I, of course, speak of the policies of segregation and state-sponsored racism. I see people of different colors and creeds standing here before me today. White, black, Hispanic, Asian, to all those affected by racism, I say that your fight is not forgotten. Civil rights are not just limited to the African-American communities. It extends to all peoples, all colors who have been discriminated against by our twisted system. There are many individuals who have had to remind had to remind us of that. In particular, I would say Cesar Chavez, a man who, to whom I owe great respect. There are, of course, countless others who have contributed to the struggle. However, the struggle itself is not over. So we must stand together regardless of color and demand that we be not judged by the color of our skin, but the content of our character and I among my friends and my friends among the progressives will ensure that such righteous demands do not fall upon deaf ears. Thank you. After another hour of off and on speaking and shaking hands, Robert Kennedy got back into the jet black Lincoln Continental that served as the head of the presidential motorcade. He drew to Hubert Humphrey, who sat next beside him. That took a bit longer than expected. I decided we're going to Washington next, Seattle specifically. A uh, diverse place, replied Humphrey. You've been winging most of these speeches so far. What are you going to talk about? The campaign's mostly about civil rights. Why stop now? Ooh, we become more divided. Labor unions could use some help up there. Hmm. They're more and more divided. Yeah. I haven't talked about unions at all, though. Where do we stand on unions in, in the center NPP? I don't know. Hold on. Let's see. Do we get do we get to see anything here? Ooh. Civil, it's mostly about civil rights. I mean, that's cool and all. But... Hmm, I don't want to divide us anymore. Let's go with labor unions. Which, actually... That's, that's going to piss someone off. I, think that, I don't know who's going to piss off, though. A city united. Yellowstone was an interesting and unusual place to hold a speech. Initially, President Bobby Kennedy had been skeptical of traveling to a remote, albeit famous, national park for one of his speeches across America. Now, however, with the reporters from dozens of major news networks standing before him, notepads in hand, he knew he was being wrong. This would not be a speech for Wyoming, nor Montana, nor Idaho, or any other state. This would be a patriotic rally cry to all of America, reminding us where we all come from and what we call home. Today, I find myself not speaking to the common people of the U.S., but rather the messengers who, to whom they listen. That does not matter. I stand here in one of the most beautiful, peaceful places our great nation has to offer to say that no matter how divided we may seem, we still are an indivisible union. Connected through soulful bonds that may never be torn apart, every year millions of people visit this place as such it remains and forever shall remain one of the great bonds that tie our union together. We are a nation of one people, one heritage, regardless of race, or color, or creed. We are not simply Americans, we are America itself, standing in such a place as this. We may be reminded in the world of our forebearers, John Winthrop, to his shipmates aboard the Arabella. As they were traveling to the new world for a new life, we must always remember, he said, that we shall be as a city upon a hill, and the eyes of, the, of all people are upon us. Today, as always, the eyes of all people remain upon us, anxiously studying the American experiment. Be it through our politics, or our culture, and fa our faith, in all levels of government, we must be construct. Be constructed of men and women of resolute strength, aware of the trust placed in them by God and the freedom-loving people of the world. Our endeavors, as with the men of Ar Arabella's endeavors, will not be judged by the basis of the color of our skin, nor the nature of our God, nor the ideology to which we owe allegiance. Rather, we will be judged by the world be built or build for future generations. It will be terrible or righteous. And an hour or so later, once reporters had asked the questions and the few tourists and shaken President's hand, Bobby Kennedy returned to the Lincoln Continental he'd been driven to Yellowstone Inn. He turned to Hubert Humphrey, who sat beside him. That took a bit longer than expected. I've decided we're going to Washington next, Seattle Pacific specifically. Oh, did we already say this stuff at the end? We can talk about civil rights. Labor unions could use some help. Oh, wait, does it, does it matter? Um, okay. Did I read that twice? Am I going crazy? I might be going crazy. A dinner in Seattle. The restaurant Phil's had a fancier aurora, aura than the name would suggest. Of course, half the place had been reserved ahead of time for the president and his entourage of secret servants and politicians. President Robert F. K. or Rob R. F. K. sat himself in a cozy little corner table with Hubert Humphrey, eating a steak after a long day of pleasantries and speeches. Well, all things considered, said Robert Kennedy, cutting a piece of filet mignon, I say that went pretty well. I'm not sure how poorly it could have gone in the first place, considering how well we pull here, but every single talking point hit a nail on the head. The people out there loved every minute of the speech. Sure, replied. Humphrey, I think that we all said out there. I think what we all said out there should help us a bit here in Washington, at least prevent us from losing the state as a whole. So what's after this that we finish this nice little dinner? Well, we got the rest of the West Coast to cover. I was thinking California. Now, I ever, if I remember correctly, there's the way we're going. If we go to California and then we go to like Alabama or something, I forget exactly what we had to do. 
it has some sort of effect on us, though. When you were standing upon the stage and just outright called Japanese sports a criminal illegal occupation of American soil, I just thought about this world stood still for a minute. Bobby Kennedy smiled as vice president. H Hubert Humphrey from across the dinner table. So, Hubert Humphrey is vice president right now. Still can't believe any politician would say something like that, huh? I'm hardly the first to spit on the Akagi Accords. Well, it just happens few and far between is all. Saying that you got a lot of support anyway, anyhow. I'm not sure I've ever seen a crowd erupt like that. They loved you, Bobby. Kennedy took another bite or slice out of his sink, eating while talking. Yeah, well, he said, I guess that means our little venture here was a success. Now I think we're heading to Texas or Alabama. All right, so now that we know that, or at least now that I know that, Hubert Humphrey is our uh, vice president, going to Alabama might not be very good. We might actually incur a lot of wrath, but in Texas, Alabama's actually all the way over here. All the way over here, I mean. That's Mississippi. I always forget where Mississippi is. Uh, the Delta, the Delta region right here. Uh, I think Alabama would be good, but I'm going to go to Texas. We're going to go to Texas. Why not? The Yellow Rose of Texas. Which city in Texas to visit gave RFK as they valued quite the argument? Some said Houston for its great population. Some recommended San Antonio for a trip to the Alamo. Some called for Austin for its place as a state capital. Bobby himself eventually had to intervene and decided to visit Austin. On the steps of the Texas capital, thousands of people of all races looked on. Besides Kennedy stood LBJ. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the famous Texan politician and former opponent of RFK's presidential run. People of Austin, before I begin, I want to thank all of you for the warm welcome I've received, not only from your city, but also your leaders. I, of course, speak to the man beside me, LBJ, one whom I greatly respect. In divided times such as uh, these, we find ourselves in presently, of course, it is easy to see only the name of the party and not the name of the man who follows it. It is easy to dismiss someone as other because of the party line. However, I say that a man is loyal to his own convictions and as such could not be judged upon the party with which he sides. I see the actions and policies of your congressman, Lyndon Johnson, and I am moved and inspired by them. He has fought for the church of civil rights as much as any progressive, so why should I not call him friend? The actions of Lyndon Johnson reflect the whole of the state of Texas and will not go unnoticed nor unappreciated. The only way that we can achieve true equality in this great nation is through the spirit of unity that ties all Americans together. Only through unity we may achieve equality. So together I believe that the Republican Democrats and the Progressives may still yet carry the torch of civil rights, not individually, but together. Bobby continues to give a short speech intermittently with Lyndon Johnson, as well as the Governor of Texas, John Connolly, for more than an hour. When the whole affair had finished and all attendees had shaken hands for unity or some such, Robert's throat was very dry and sore, and his hand ached from the, cr the crushing grip of LBJ. <laughs> he hopped back into the jet black continental with the Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Next stop, Alabama, he said. Wallace is going to give you crap. That's a given, said Humphrey. We could rub it in his face. Let's make the governor uncomfortable with time to spread the gospel civil rights. Let's just talk about the poor of Alabama. We don't need to rile up Wallace. Let's not piss him off too much. I mean, we could. But I'm not sure that's really going to help us that much. Just saying. Just saying. Uh, just like the... Uh, that. Nevada needs some stuff. You need some stuff right there, guys. Uh, Vermont. Oh, that's where Vermont is. I never know where Vermont is. And West Virginia. Do we have any other places that need... Yes. I missed roads. Are you kidding me? Oh, I'm failing my duty as a YouTuber. I missed roads. And the ports, too. Okay, seriously, what the heck? Come on. There we go. Just for that. Uh, there we go. Cool. Nope. Cool. And we almost get... Hey, we do get one today. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So how's Alabama going to go? Please don't kill me here. Please don't kill RFK. Please. <laughs> oh, the cyphers are done. Oh, nice. Quite a bit of lag. That's okay. Get some of that. And for this, just like, it doesn't really matter. There you go, there you go, there you go. Oh, we still need to finish up that, all that stuff, too. Okay. Boom, boom. Do everyone close to Germany, but don't actually do Germany. There you go. And there we go. Improve relations with these guys. Advanced firearms. Cool. It's taking a while to get to the event for, uh... The one in Alabama. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Planned suburbs are nice. We really do live in a society. Throughout the rigorous pursuit of both truth and justice, we have come to learn of harsh truths and grave injustices both. We have learned of a webwork of clients and patrons stretched from coast to coast, including with one colluding with one another to keep the car car carcass of hateful ideology alive. We have learned of suffering and dealt directly and indirectly by Americans to Americans born with the misfortunate or misfortune of unlike skin. We have learned of the iron fists that bear whip and chain and clad themselves in old glorious hues, lording over miserable men just as their ancestors had but a century ago. Now that we haven't known then, of course, but enlightenment does bring clarity to sight. Words and actions of rep representable 
reprehensible men than puzzle pieces each showing some but not all, suddenly locking into perfect shape. Now that we know their conviction, their utter belief in a hatred which seems to look behind every of our corner. Behind every... Behind our every corner. Now we know how far this poison has tainted the idyllic veneer of American society, blemishing its hallowed values with so much hypocrisy. Much has already been done to undo the damage. Perhaps we've still got a long way to go from fully repairing our society from it. I'm sorry that I'm talking like this. <clears throat> Oof. Maybe I've already played too much work for today. Meet your new neighbors. We may have mostly dealt with redlining in the business and financial communities, but unfortunately that's not enough to immediately tear down the invisible barriers and formally segregating American suburbs and neighborhoods. Forcibly integrating pre-existing suburbs in is a fool's errand. Perhaps there's a way to bring America into a new age of racial harmony without having to confront all the baggage of our communities carry around with them. The solution. <clears throat> Planned suburbs filled with affordable tract housing, built on the outskirts of our major cities, intended to house inner-city working-class blacks and whites alike. We can give out interest-free interest -free loans to families wanting to settle there to prevent the possibility of black families getting redlined out right out of our new post-racial paradises. Surely, once they get to know their new neighbors, people will be able to see the past the skin, the color of the skin. Everyone's going to love it, and we get we already get the event. They didn't love it. Oh God. Oh my goodness. Oh jeez. Hey, but the GDP, man. And Broken Air, the sum of all fears. Approximately 40 minutes ago, a B-52 Strato Fortress on standard airborne alert patrol out of the naval air station Selfoss and Ison radioed a distress signal and accompanying encrypted message. The message indicated that the naval's aircraft vertical stabilizers had partially broken off and that the crew would be forced to ditch into the Norwegian Sea. Aboard the aircraft was one Mark 28 pneumo thermonuclear war warhead or weapon. And as such, this incident is being classified as Broken Arrow. This is a loose bu nuclear bomb out there, guys. Given known weather conditions and established USAF safety protocols, we believe that the crew is most likely alive and floating approximately 115 miles to the southwest of Yan Mayan Island. The wreckage of the aircraft and potentially the accompanying weapon would most likely still be visible from the air. There's no indication that the German military is presently aware of the situation, but given known German radar capabilities, it is overwhelmingly likely that this will not be the case within 24 hours' time. We recommend that relevant Navy and Air Force elements be immediately tasked to rescue their and retrieval operations. So ordered. Hopefully they don't do anything. Please, please, please. I don't want to go to war. I don't want to go to war, man. You gotta get more political power, though. Mm. I mean, the OFN unity, unity is pretty high, though, which is pretty good. The Germans set a flotilla. Boost. So, per photographs from our keyhole reconnaissance satellites, the Kriegsmarine has dispatched a sizable flotilla of minesweepers, submarine r rescue ships, and even cruisers to the approximate lo location of the down P-52. Additionally, Luftwaffe aircraft have been detected in the Norwegian Sea by multiple Iceland-based radar stations. We believe that they detected the B-52's crash and intend to salvage wreckage and nuclear weapon along with any survivors. This is an absolutely critical threat to our national security and technological capabilities. However, we can stop this. The CIA possesses several back channels within the German government. We advise that a secret message be sent to the German leadership at once, demanding that they halt the flotilla so that we can rescue the crew. To do so otherwise would be a blow to our national security and prestige, although it may decrease the tensions. What should we do? Tell the Germans to back off. Let them, we can take a hit. Let them pass. Don't back off. I mean, we will back off if they don't eventually. Because I don't want World War III right now. Just saying. I don't want World War III. So, we really do live in a society, though. But into the lights. <clears throat> Give me just one moment, please, before I read it. My apologies with step uh, by arduous step. Had we taken the path to a brighter place, where every American is privileged to enjoy the essential values and virtues of their patrimony, freedom, liberty, equality, and prosperity. The journey has not been easy. Our feet are blistered and sore from the hundredfold miles of travel and the heat and roughness of inky black asphalt. Scars and wounds mar our flesh, left by monsters and bandits. The voices of doubt yet whisper from the recesses of our minds, tempting us with illusions of earthy comfort wherever our eyes land. So now it has been long since we last laid in rest that we have forgotten the touch of soft cotton embroidered linens. Dirty, famished parched. The body can only do so much against its instinct, and it beggars us uh, to stop even for a short while. But we have not stopped. We cannot stop for now. Not when the promised land shimmers in the distant horizon. If we're to rest our feet forever, then let them tread into the land of night or the land of light, where forever is beautiful. Keeping up with the Thomases. Okay, Germans, you gotta back down. The Germans push on. According to the keyhole of satellite data and our radar stations on Iceland, the loop off on Kriegsmarine assets uh, are sets. Assessed that the Germans had been moving onto the Norwegian Sea and are still on course for the B-52 crash site. This is utterly unacceptable. We need to send our naval and air assets to directly intercept the German flotilla. Such a signal likely force the Germans to back off and accept that we will be handling the crash situation. Otherwise, we would be hurting our credibility as a superpower, and the Germans would get access to a host of our secret technical knowledge. This is to say nothing of the present risk to American life, which we do. Stop the Germans. Uh, this is going to even hurt us more. We're going to stop those Germans. Them. Americans from one coast to the other are terrified of them. The horde advanced over the hill. Uh, the darkness in the night, intent on annihilating everything they hold dear, believing themselves in constant danger from the, the men their ancestors had forcibly brought to their shores, they denounced blacks as carrying the curse of ham 
Of being an inferior race that must be segregated, it lets you destroy the American way of life. America's hatred has ossified over the decades, tainting our every institution. This must end. The time has come to wrench the dark thorn of hate from America's heart, to reform the nation and the end of never-ending culture war. It only makes sense to start with schools, one of the most egregious examples of segregation today. If they spend every day in proximity with black students, white children will surely make friends with them and will eventually graduate with a less prejudiced mindset than their parents before them. It's past due that we intervene and push integration, perhaps by creating a formal federal agency responsible for the integration. President Kennedy sits alone in the Oval Office and wonders what to do. In his heart, he wants to forcibly integrate everything as fast as possible and wipe clean the stain of segregation from America, but something gnaws at him. Maybe too much. Maybe too fast will do more harm than good. Jack would have gone slower and more steady. But Jack lies in, in Arlington Gray. The president froze at his brow. It's my decision now, for good or ill. Integration now, integration tomorrow, integration forever. Sloan City wins the race, right? I'm gonna... It, it, it would be smarter. Let's just be realistic here. To go slow and steady. So... If you want these reforms, it's probably better to go slow and steady, because we still might get assassinated. But regardless, we're going to end today's episode right there, to savor that little spot of whether the Germans want to have World War III or not. But regardless, hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe for you. If you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you all tomorrow in episode 12B. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.